Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on this uh, Tuesday afternoon. We're really excited to have you here with us. Um, for those who don't know, these cross-agency trainings are sponsored by Heading Home of South Central, Heading Home of South Central Indiana, which I work for. I'm the assistant director of it. Uh, my name is Tatiana Wheeler. Happy to see you. Uh, even more happier to have Elliot Zanz of Coalition for Homelessness Intervention and Prevention, which is housed in Indianapolis here with us as our guest presenter. So give a round of applause as we welcome Elliot. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. I'm excited to see all of you, even though clearly this is the no-go zone. Um, Y'all could move up if you want, but no rush. I know everyone's settled, you got your lunch. Please feel free to keep eating, um, take care of yourselves. It's, I'm just so excited to be here. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Um, yeah, my name is Elliot Zanz. I work with CHIP, which is the HMIS and CES lead for Indianapolis COC, and we also do a lot of planning around the NOFO. Um, and I'll get into it. I think I have the high tech clicking. I do, cool. We have an agenda, so we'll go through a quick check-in. Introductions, I'll introduce myself. I would love for you folks to introduce yourselves. Um, not necessarily to the whole group for time's sake, but we'll figure it out. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the context and orientation that we are working in in 2023 in Indiana. Um, we're gonna go over our learning objectives, and I'm gonna talk about a framework called the Collective Impact Framework, uh, which hopefully y'all find useful. Um, we're gonna talk about relationships. We're going to talk about data. I bet you probably haven't heard those two things in the same presentation a ton, but it is really important, and I'm stoked to talk about it. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about navigating challenges in direct service, um, and we'll go from there. So let's, real quick, do a check-in. Um, thumbs up for I'm great, you are the happy dog with the yellow. Doing okay for beanie dog, you're here. You're not under duress, but you're here. Not so great, thumbs down. You're just having a rough day, migraine, you're over it. Okay, mostly, mostly here, some here, okay, cool. Thank you for your honesty. I am here because I love public speaking because I'm a weirdo that way and now I have a captive audience, so we get to live that life. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, where I'm coming from, so before I get into all this stuff about me as a human being, I'm gonna talk about me professionally a little bit. My background is in case management. I entered the continuum of care in Indianapolis in June of 2020 as a housing navigator for the non-congregate emergency shelter at Crown Plaza. So it was this fancy hotel turned emergency COVID shelter um, during the early pandemic and that's how I got into doing any of this work. Um, I have a background in psychology and a master's in evidence-based social intervention from Oxford which is really fancy and mostly meant no nonprofit wanted to hire me because they thought I was too fancy for them. Uh, I really just wanted to pay my bills though and I moved to Indiana for housing from Colorado. Uh, so I entered the sphere there. I spent a year doing basically housing navigation and emergency shelter running with a very small team. And then I spent another year doing um, rapid rehousing case management for the Homeless Initiative Program, uh, which actually has been working down here in Bloomington with awesome Melissa and the team. So yeah, that's kind of some of my direct provider experience. And then I moved over to CHIP where I was hired as the HMIS Technical Assistance Coordinator, which is not what I thought I would be doing. I will talk more about that in a minute. But anyway, uh, yeah, thanks again. So here's some things about myself as a human. I am a relationship-centered extrovert. I love humans. I wanna hang out with them. I wanna talk to them all the time. I've got three partners and they're all introverts and they're tired of it. Um, thank goodness there's three of them. Uh, I believe in radical hospitality. I believe in community care. I believe in direct action. I think the world could be what we make it, um, but we have to be brave enough to make those decisions and do things a little bit differently. Uh, I believe housing is a human right. Homelessness is a political decision. 
we could be making different decisions. Uh, I am a proud mother dad of six amazing young humans and I just became a grandparent, which is wild. Uh, don't even know how that happened. I've been parenting for four years, so I think I set a land speed record. Don't try and do the math, it doesn't make sense. Um, I'm an artist sometimes, I painted that shark. Those are my cats, they're cute and they're terrible. Uh, I am multiracial multi Native Hawaiian and I am genderqueer and I am trans. And I say that because this is not a really safe world for us and so I try and be real loud about that every time someone gives me a microphone, so now you know. Um, I use they, them pronouns, I wear skirts. I don't owe anyone androgyny. I can cook you a really good meal, but it will take so long. Last night I made gochujang chicken and it took too long, but it was really good. I'm also the co-producer of the Homeward Indie podcast, which has been really such a wonderful thing to come into my life, where we talk to providers and we talk to board members and we talk to people all through the continuum of care for Indianapolis and we broadcast it on our podcast. And I'm more of a people person than a data person, which is bold for me to say, because I'm about to talk to you about data anyway. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more about my role and how, how it all kind of fits together. So as I said, I was hired as the HMIS Technical Assistance Coordinator. Um, I thought that was insane. I told Danielle, I was like, have you seen how bad my case notes are? You want me to tell other people how to do HMIS? Are you kidding me? Uh, and she's like, no, but you're good at people. And that's what we need. We need someone to go talk to agencies and talk to people about their data. I was like, oh, okay, I could maybe do that. So I did and here we are. Um, I do a lot of site visits. I do technical assistance. I don't do like help desk level technical assistance. I do kind of larger level troubleshooting. Um, I've ended up talking a lot and doing a lot of presentations like this about data and why it matters and how it connects to that bigger picture, which I had no idea of when I was working as a case manager. Like no one told me, hey, you're part of the continuum of care. This is what a continuum of care is. Here's what that means. Here's where your data actually goes and how it affects everybody else, including all of the clients, all of the people trying to find housing and other agencies trying to provide that housing. Um, so that's something that I keep coming back to in my presentations. I need to breathe. Um, I do new project onboarding. I oversee our data quality plan, and I oversee the HMIS user group and H HMIS advisory work group. And yes, I will be deacroniming HMIS. Probably everyone in this room knows what it is, but just in case, it is Homelessness Management Information System, and it is a class of databases. Um, yeah. I also lately have been calling myself the data ambassador because it's way catchier and I don't have to explain like six acronyms every time I mention my position. Okay, so now we're gonna take a minute. I want you to introduce yourselves um, to the folks at your table and I'm gonna kinda just come around and say hi, cause I can. Um, give your name, pronouns if you want to share them, your role, your agency, and then share one thing that brought you comfort or joy in the last week. Could be anything, could be little, could be big, whatever, whatever you're feeling. Could be the best snack you ever had. Um, we're flexible, so we'll take like five minutes and do that.
Hello, friends. Sorry I didn't make it very far around the room. Um, hopefully we all had a chance to introduce ourselves a little bit. Oh, I have one more task for everybody. Each table, I need you to elect a note runner. This isn't yet, but pick somebody who's gonna bring sticky notes up to me at some point. Okay. I'll actually give you like a whole minute to do that, carry on. Okay, hopefully you've elected a note runner. If not, we can fight about it in a little bit. Thank you for sharing of yourselves with each other. Um, does anyone want to raise their hand and volunteer something that brought them joy this week? Yes. I love that. Gay volunteer squash. Anybody else want to share anything fun? Small. Doesn't have to be that deep. Don't overthink it. One more before I volunteer somebody. You got the weather. Yes. It is fall. It is officially fall. It is the time of the sweaters. We're excited about it. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. I appreciate you. OK, less fun, which is, you know, Indiana. Uh, so I just always like to be really real and acknowledge the context in which we are doing this work, because we are not doing this work in an imaginary vacuum. We are doing this work here in Indiana in 2023. Wages are down. Indiana is one of the last states in the nation for wage. We're way behind the national average. Um, especially the outer counties. Marion's a little inflated, but it also steals commuters from outer counties, so, you know. Um, obviously, no one's getting paid enough. Our wages have massively stagnated. They are actually, minimum wage is like adjusted for inflation lower right now than it was in 1980. It would have been 1160. If you want some more fun reasons to be grumpy. Um, evictions have increased. Rent has massively increased. The price of housing and land has massively increased. None of these things are new or surprising. There are very few tenant protections. Landlords can basically do whatever they want. A lot of them plan evictions into their business plan instead of repairs because they know um, that tenants can't fight them if they fail to maintain the property. Uh, and it's cheaper for them to have a lawyer on retainer for evictions than it is for them to repair the property properly. Uh, and there's very limited housing, and we know that this is what we're up against, but we're all still trying to do the work, and we are doing the work, and I get how hard that is. And so anytime you feel like you're not doing enough or it's not enough, let's acknowledge the reality in which we are working, which is not good. Uh, here's the living wage table from MIT for Monroe County. Um, I looked and I saw most of Monroe and Morgan County has the biggest population of Region 10, and most of your folks are maybe families or mostly single individuals, so I kind of highlighted what it would cost for one adult with no children to live. Um, $32.98 with one child, $16.39 with zero, and I would say that's still low. Living wage, quote unquote, versus the $7.25, which is our min federal minimum, um, which has not changed. Uh, with two adults, one of them working, um, no children, you would need 2660 an hour. One child, you would need 3255 an hour. I don't know if I'm making 3255 an hour. Uh, two adults both working, 1330 with zero children per person, one child, 1851. So when we're talking about income and paying rent and we're frustrated with our clients because they are not maintaining employment or maybe they're ma maintaining employment and it's not enough and that is not on them. So other things that I want us to just like ground in as we talk about the work we're doing. So 
a fun question for you. Why do you do this very hard work? And I think I heard some answers already today, um, just talking a little bit, because we care about people getting housed ostensibly. But what are some other reasons? What are, just think, what are the pieces of your work that make it worth doing all of the hard stuff? And this isn't actually something you need to tell me, or you can if you want to, you can volunteer. I just want us to kind of reflect and sit with that. Like, why, are, why do we get up and keep doing this to ourselves every day? Which is a question I ask myself a lot as a case manager. I have nothing but respect for direct service. Um, does anyone want a volunteer reason why they do the work that they do? Absolutely, it fills a gap that's not being met because we know our society should be serving us better. And so we're called to step in. Anyone else? That seems to sum it up pretty. I mean, what else is there to say at that point? We are all here because we believe that everyone has the right to be housed and connected to care. I feel like I can declare this to any room of people I speak to that are doing this work. Um, if it's not true for someone, I would be really a bit confused. <laughs> but we're all here because we believe this at our core. Like, this is why we're doing this. This is why you're listening to me talk on your lunch break. All right, so we're going to move on to learning objectives, and then I'm going to clip through because I had a kind of slow, lazy start. But that's okay. Um, so I want for you folks to be able to understand the role of a relationship-centered approach in the context of the work that you do. I want you to hopefully have some idea about the collective impact framework and how it can be used to structure our work and our work more broadly speaking so at a bigger systemic level. And to understand how your data impacts everyone um, and the importance of data stewardship, which I will also be talking about. All right, so we'll talk about collective impact first. It is a five tenant framework that brings together basically interested parties um, from multiple fields and organizations to address social issues. Um, came up with by some social scientists, John Kenya and Mark Kramer in 2011. They like coined the term, but when you see the pieces of it, you'll be like, ah yes, of course, this makes sense. Um, basically, it's a framework that promotes collaboration and shared responsibility and just kind of breaks down the pieces of how a system needs to have different elements to function. And it's a way to view the work we do at a systems level and kind of strategize accordingly. Um, we were introduced to this idea at CHIPS. I've, I came to it since I worked at CHIP and I love it, so I keep talking about it and sharing it. All right, so the very first tenant of a collective impact framework is a common agenda. What is the driving force? Our common agenda is that we all believe that everyone should be housed and connected to care. That's it, it can be that simple. So it's a shared vision for change with agreed upon actions and a shared definition of the problem. That's when it gets a little stickier. It can be as simple as we believe everyone should have housing, um, agreed upon actions and the shared definition of the problem. Sometimes we have different understandings. We're coming from different perspectives um, and collective impact is cool because it makes us think about how are we coming at this differently, but what are the common elements that we can like agree on and move forward so that we can actually make decisions and make effective change. You have to have a shared measurement system, otherwise there's no way to track your progress that everyone can agree upon. Um, for us, it's HMIS data. HMIS is kind of our repository, it's our shared information system, it's where we can see the work everyone's doing, we can see how a client moves throughout a system and where they're touching, who are their case managers, how can we connect them to care, how can we find them for that housing referral that finally came through, really important stuff. Backbone support organization. So having a separate organization with dedicated staff um, skilled to support the infrastructure, that is the role CHIP plays for the Indianapolis continuum of care. I know Balance of State is structured very differently but um, giving some consideration to ways different agencies can plug in and help lift some of the administrative stress or planning stress off of direct service providers is super helpful. I think heading home in this region has some really cool ideas around that and hopefully can work to support you guys in some of those ways. Um, but yeah, it's a thing to consider. Like admin work is a big piece of this. 
having mutually reinforcing activities, so making sure that we're helping each other, we're not hindering each other, we're not being redundant, we're doing our best like for outreach coverage, for example, we're communicating with other agencies so we know this area and this area are both covered and we're not just all here and missing the people on the east side or the whatever side happens to be a problem, um, as one example. But making sure everyone's working together in a coordinated fashion. And then continuous communication. This is critical for building trust, um, for having transparency, for feeling like everyone is part of this effort and in the loop, and for maintaining our relationships, which I'm gonna talk more about, but continuous communication, and that's also hard, and it also does take time and effort. So this is a little map out I made for the Indiana Balance of State Continuum of Care. I have one for Indianapolis, and it looks very similar. Um, Basically, it shows a continuum of care defined broadly as all of the organizations and agencies working together to end homelessness in a given region. So Indianapolis is its own COC, balance of state for the rest of Indiana is a separate continuum of care. Um, all continuums of care have these elements of homelessness prevention. Does anyone work in prevention in this room? Raise your hand if so. No, yes, yes, awesome. Some prevention, street outreach. Who's in street outreach? Got some street outreach. Got more street outreach. Uh, other social services and benefits providers. Um, that includes working with probably the fire department, um, working with insurance agencies, social security, um, doctors, things like that. Housing and services, huge piece obviously, transitional housing, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing. Who's in housing in this room? Hello, housing is in the house. Great. Um, emergency shelter and services. Obviously, very necessary if you have emergency shelter people. Great, hi, glad you're here. Um, and coordinated entry system assessments and intakes as kind of an overarching part of that. Um, and then you have your HMIS lead agency, which for balance of state is IHCDA, based in Indianapolis though, um, which I know is a bit of a struggle sometimes. And they are also the collaborative applicant and NOFO grant recipient for your continuum of care. So they get the big federal grant and share it out, as some of you may know. I had no idea what a NOFO was when I was a case manager. I now know more than I want to. Um, okay, here's the fun part. A collective impact approach centers the following. Systems are made of people. This is not revolutionary, but it feels kind of revolutionary. Systems are made of people. We talk about it like they aren't. Um, relationships are the core of systems. So if you want to change the system, you have to get the system in the room. Look, we're a whole system in the room, represented as per the previous slide. Very awesome, and I'm very excited about that. Um, relationships are everything. With relationship-centered work, relationships are the first goal. And this applies to you and your coworkers, this applies to you and your clients, this applies across the board. Relationships are the first goal, and that is not what we are taught. We are taught the goal is the service, the goal is the outcome, the goal is whatever. No, the goal is the relationship. Because if you do not have good relationships, all of that other work is going to be unnecessarily harder. And we all know this, we've all had like our own systemic baggage and frustrations with other providers and everyone is on fire and in fight or flight all the time. And that does not always make us the easiest humans to be around. I was not the easiest human to be around when I was a case manager, it was a bad time. Um, some people can handle it more gracefully than others. I wasn't one of them, uh, which is why I'm doing this now. But um, relationships are the agents of change. Like this is how we will do work that matters is by having better relationships. It is how we progress. It is how we are aligned enough to actually move forward rather than kind of tripping over each other as we try and maybe vaguely go in the same direction. Um, this is also based on the fact that no one can end homelessness alone. We, we all know that, like this is a team effort. Um, when you care for people, people care for you. People respond to my emails 100 times faster if they have met me in person and we have had a conversation and I know their cat's name, right? Yeah. Um, when you center relationships in your work, it transforms your work. All right. Here's sticky note time. I have left sticky notes and some pens. I'm sorry, not very many pens. There are some more pens up front here. Please do the following. Take four sticky notes, number them one through four, and then fill them out with the following. 
a word that describes a positive relationship, a word that describes a negative relationship, and this isn't romantic necessarily, just a relationship between two humans any, of any sort, a word that describes a professional relationship, and a word that describes your favorite relationship. And then when you're done, give all your sticky notes to somebody and bring them to this table I just decided. Um, in, that's a great question. Whatever's faster. <laughs> Whatever makes sense. You can be either way. You can work together on it. It's 12.43, I'm gonna give us until 12.45. Don't overthink it. Thanks. <laughs> I'm just here. I'll just be here. I'm just gonna write. Thank you. Oh, there's plenty of data. Yes, I did, in fact. Yes, good. Got all the data I requested and then some. All right. Beautiful, thank you. Thanks for all the data and the assists in organizing it. I will give us one second and I will start telling you what we found. All right. Characteristics of positive relationships as communicated to me by you. We've got nurturing, uh, heard, trust, fun, caring, respectful, warm, more caring, loving, collaborative, supportive, open, honest, active, empowering, truthful, fulfilling. Cool, really good, Th we agree, those are all positive. Um, negative, forced, frustrating, contentious, foreboding, draining, reductive,
combative, hindering, exhausting, hostile. I've got some repeats, judgmental, passive, silent. And then for three, I was, I was inspired last night. Um, I was like, what, what sounds like professional relationships to folks? So we have limited, utilitarian, uh, respected, collaborative, two collaboratives, cooperative, clinical, transactional, restricted, transparent, polite, partnership, successful, effective, respectful, trust, restrained, and I can't read that, sorry. <laughs> I was really trying. Um, cool, so professional is an interesting one for us. I think there's a mix of kind of positive and negative things. Some of those are good. Collaborative is a great thing. Partnership is a great thing. Polite, not a bad thing. Um, but then there's also transactional. Um, we had restricted clinical utilitarian, some kind of cold language associated with professionalism or professional relationships rather. Uh, and then our favorite relationships are trusting. They're loving, laughter, fun. I got fun mul multiple times. Unconditional, snuggling, rewarding, playful, completing, creative, smart ass. Me and food, smiley face, goofy. And yeah, more fun, more trusting. We love it. Okay, cool. Thank you all for participating in this activity. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this on my next slide. So we're gonna talk about transform transactional versus transformational relationships. And I think it's pretty interesting and in telling that a lot of our descriptors for professional relationships were kind of on this transactional side impersonal one way, like this corporate idea of how humans are allowed to interact in a professional way, um, lacking in some like authentic connection maybe. Um, transformational relationships are personal, they're mutual, um, they're organic, warm, trusting. A lot of our favorite relationships are trusting, uh, empowering and generous. I feel like generosity is a really big thing here. Um, if there's one thing I've learned being a polyamorous person, it's that generosity and radical trust will get you everywhere. Rules and fear will stop you from getting anywhere. And I know that's not the life y'all are necessarily trying to live, but as it applies to work and how we treat one another with generosity and this, this assumption of goodwill, um, that kind of mental shift can really change the way we interact with each other. So I wanna challenge everyone to kind of reflect on Whatever relationship, work specifically work relationship, you know needs attention. You're like, it's, it's, it's something's wrong, it's stuck, it's stagnant, it's, we maybe need to sit down and have a beverage, adults or otherwise, and have an honest conversation with each other where we say, hey, this hurt, that was frustrating, why did you not do this? We have to have some of these courageous conversations with each other if we wanna be able to do this really hard and complicated work. And this also applies to like our internal reflective processes when we're working with clients. What assumptions am I carrying? Am I being paternalistic? Am I making a lot of judgments about how this person is trying to survive through life because it's not how I think they should be trying to survive through life? Um, and just calling our attention back to the relationships that make our lives. All right, we're taking a sharp pivot into some more data kind of things. Um, small mini agenda, I'm just gonna get into it. All right, free association, and you can just shout this out. There are no sticky notes involved. What comes to your mind when you hear the word data or data? S spreadsheets, numbers, huh? Pain in the ass, ugh. Huh? Funding. Grant reports. Yes. <laughs> Wishing I had written that down sooner. I feel that in my soul. All right, so we've got, and like, what about scary? Does it feel scary and intimidating sometimes? I feel like I was kind of intimidated by it. I was intimidated by being told I was gonna be the agent, MIS person. And then I was like, wait, I've got this. We can do this, we can do scary things. It's not actually that scary. It's just the information. Data, 
facts and statistics collected together for reference or analysis. It's how we tell client stories. It is how we translate the true chaos of human life into this sterile space that HUD can understand. And I know we all don't love that, and I don't necessarily love that, but it is part of the reality. And also, if we do a good job of it, it can really help us to secure funding and to prove our work because we live in a bureaucracy we have to navigate. So talking, taking a step way, way back to the homelessness management information system that we oh so love, client track, I believe. Everyone's on client track here too. Cool. I understood that to be the case, but I just for a moment had this deep fear that I was wrong. Um, anyway, HMIS is a database class that complies with HUD requirements of federal data standards and reporting. So it's a class of databases. There are a lot of different vendors who make HMIS databases. Client track is one of the databases made by Ecovia. There are different vendors. I didn't know this either when I was a case manager, so I feel like I need to share it every time I talk. Um, client track is the software that the balance of state uses to record client level data and Indianapolis as well. And all COCs that receive funding from HUD are required to use an HMIS to record data and report it to HUD with our CAPERS and our APRs and all the fun grant reports that we get to do. So I wanna talk about why HMIS matters. Um, so obviously it enables partner agencies to see how a client is moving through the system, which we already discussed. It also tells us what's happening and where the gaps are, where are the gaps we are trying to fill, and then hopefully inform us how, how to best fill them. It allows us to tell client stories to stakeholders while maintaining client privacy, which is very important. It's the language we use to show our work, but over everything, data today is housing for tomorrow. The data that you collect today directly impacts the funding we get across the state for housing tomorrow. And like, if, y if your agency doesn't focus on data quality, a completely different agency could lose PSH funding because we are all scored as a group project by HUD in like the worst Hunger Games group project you have ever heard of, <laughs> which we all know is true, and I'm just gonna say that. Um, and here is just kind of repeating what I'm saying. The NOFO is Notice of Funding Opportunity. If you did not know, this is the giant federal grant every year that HUD makes everyone jump through 5,000 hoops to complete. Uh, it's very complicated and ridiculous. It's an annual competition and all of Indiana is scored as the balance of state COC. So your data impacts other people's funding. Your data impacts other people's funding. I didn't understand this when I was doing this work. Um, and now that I do, I shout about it a lot. Um, fewer clients will get housed and connected to care if we do not all do a good job contributing to our shared measurement system under this common agenda that we want everyone to get housed and connected to care. And I also want to acknowledge that if we get funding, some other state doesn't. It's all bad. It's not okay, but this is the world we're in, so we're all in this together and we're in this together locally and we kind of have to maintain that mindset until such time as we have massive policy overhauls or you know it, everything just completely stops working. I'm not really sure which is gonna happen first. Um, but the better Indiana scores, the more funding we have across Indiana for all agencies and the more opportunities clients are gonna have. So this is how we get through the gate kept funding. Now we will talk a little bit about data stewardship. How are we taking care of that data that we are eventually going to get to HUD? Um, data stewardship is the collection of practices that ensure a client's data is accessible, usable, safe, and also trusted. Like, is it trustworthy? Can another case manager come in and know that that phone number is probably correct? Who knows, because that changes minute to minute, but we do our best, right? Every piece of information a client gives you is a gift of trust, and our clients give us a lot of trust, even though they rarely have much to show for it at the end of the day, not necessarily because of us, but because the way this whole context is stacked. Um, client information becomes data that can tell that story of their experience through our housing system and tell us how we are doing and whether or not we are serving people appropriately and equitably 
when someone entrusts you with their information, you then have a responsibility to capture it as accurately as possible, as possible um, record it appropriately, safeguard it, and make sure it is conveyed to the appropriate parties to assist them. We've got Gandalf there. Keep it secret, keep it safe. Please record it. Please upload the documents. We need the documents. All right, I'm gonna run through. These are the key pieces of data that really matter from the big level to direct service, and it's not actually case notes. Um, I feel like case notes were the pain of my existence, but really what we're talking about here is enrollments. Um, they basically tell your client that you have their back, that they are part of your program and under your care. Um, it answers the question, who is served by your program? When were they served? Um, every program type should be enrolling every single client that you serve. And I know it's a pain. Uh, but they should ideally, and this is for um, RCOC, they should be entered within eight calendar days for Indianapolis. I don't actually know what your timeliness standards are. I'm sorry, I forgot to look that up. Um, it should be in a data quality plan somewhere. But ideally, the sooner you do an enrollment within the time you actually got their intake information and enter that into HMIS, the better, because you will then remember what they told you, which leaves really fast, as I remember. Um, street outreach, this means every client you interact with, even if you don't have all of their information yet, still enroll them. Um, permanent support of housing, other permanent housing and rapid rehousing. Enrollment should be entered as soon as the client agrees to work with your program and gives you their information. That's not always the same as the move-in date. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I know there are also mitigating circumstances around that for PSH, but we can get into that discussion at another time. All right, exits. Also one of the pieces that are so important for all of the federal grant reporting. They tell us who left, where they went, and whether or not we succeeded in housing them. Um, exit destinations answer the question, did they end, did clients end their homelessness by obtaining stable housing? Um, and accurate exit destinations are so critical for all programs. I think I have a link in here somewhere to the HUD exit destinations list. Making sure we're capturing that correctly is super critical, and I know it's also hard and sometimes impossible because sometimes people just leave and you don't know where they went but in as much as we can, making sure we have correct exit destinations and dates recorded for anyone leaving a program is super valuable. Annual assessments, I feel like these are really overlooked a lot. They capture income, non-cash benefits like health insurance, and, oh, and health insurance, non-cash benefits. What are some other non-cash benefits? Food stamps, things like that. Assessments answer the question, are people in your program being connected to care? Income, employment, and insurance. They are to be conducted for any clients enrolled in a program for one calendar year or more. So this mostly applies to rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing. Um, annual assessment should always be conducted within a 60 day window of a client's first anniversary in the program, 30 days on either side. If the anniversary is March 1st, um, the assessment should be captured in February or by the end of March. Document check, I put this on there because we all know how important it is. Um, fortunately, we have an upload and it is not actually that horrible stack of paper anymore, um, but it gives you a safe place to store essential client documents. Hopefully you all know this. Does anyone not know what document check is? I'm not asking you to call yourself out. Just if you don't know, find out where it is in HMIS and please upload your client's birth certificates and driver's licenses onto it because they will lose them and then you will have a copy. Um, yeah, it's just one of the easiest ways to help clients achieve housing. So much housing and so many housing referrals are lost because we don't have some vital document and the lag to get it takes a long time. All right, I'm gonna talk about data quality. It's my favorite. Data quality is the degree to which um, the data is correct and it accurately captures the situation you're trying to convey. Um, the components we're gonna go over, there are a bajillion components of data quality if you really want to go down a rabbit hole on Wikipedia or on any aspect of the internet. Um, but the ones we're doing are accuracy, completeness, and timeliness, because those are the most critical ones. Completeness. Do you have all the information? That's really it. Um, it helps ensure clients receive services and are connected to care as quickly as possible. Timeliness. Did you enter it as close to the activity, like if they left your program, did you actually exit them then or did you exit them three weeks later? Um, accuracy, is it 
as accurate as possible to what's going on with the client. I know that can get complicated sometimes. You'll have somebody who leaves, sh leaves their housing to go to shelter for two days um, and obviously work through that with your supervisors. And we also have a HUD regional office that can sometimes give advice on how exactly to do that and to capture that. Um, but we want to be doing our best to understand um, the extent of the need without compromising client access to resources. Okay, here's my favorite soapbox. I have a lot of favorites. You probably noticed that by now. Um, spending more time on data stewardship does mean spending less time face-to-face -face with clients. And when you are always responding to crisis and like always answering the calls, it is so hard. And like even doing data entry was always so hard for me because I would sit down and then I would go, oh, I need to do these five tasks for this client, and then off I would go, which is why my data entry was always terrible. Um, but it also does mean serving your clients more fully. When you have all of their information and it's all where it needs to be, they have been fully and better served by you and you have done a better job of protecting and caring for the gift of their trust that they have given you. And I would argue that this is a direct service act. It just really doesn't feel like it and that's hard. Um, and I want to talk about our moral integrity because I think it took me a while to come to this realization that when I, as a good person who cares about people, was put in the position of answering a crisis or entering data, the crisis will always win. Of course it will always win because you're a good person and you're good at this work and you care about your client. So the trick is if you don't hear about it, you don't have to respond to it. Put your phone on, do not disturb. Find your blocks of time. I know that sounds like impossible and wild, but seriously. And if you're an admin, help your, help your people. Make a policy. Make a personal policy if admin has not given you a policy to protect your moral integrity. I am only available from this time to this time. I am not available on these days or these afternoons. Just let your clients know that. You can be like, this is a new policy. And use the policy language to protect your moral integrity because they understand you have working hours and that's real. That is, the, I think, the only way I could maybe carve out enough time. And some folks might already have an amazing process in place. I didn't, and it was rough, and I really wish I had. Um, but protect blocks of your time. It can be whatever block of time makes sense to you, depending on your workflow and your organization. Um, set new expectations with your clients about your availability. Turn your work phone to do not disturb so you can still check the texts. That was also what always got me. I was like, I need my phone, though. Like half of my case notes are in my phone. Um, but I just wanna like really acknowledge that that tension is there and it is real and sometimes the crisis is going to win and that's fine because sometimes it has to. And that crisis response is a huge part of our work and I don't ever wanna discount that or discount the value of it. Um, and also, if you don't hear about it, you don't have to respond to it. Uh, if it gets to you regardless, then it's probably a big enough crisis that you should be responding to it, and that's okay. But those are some of my considerations for how to protect your moral integrity around data versus service or admin versus direct service. So just to reiterate, um, data, is a, data quality is a critical part of client care and quality data is quality client care in so many ways. Because if we don't know that your program served 250 people because only 35 of them got enrolled, then that doesn't express the need and, the, and your work. It doesn't show the amazing level of work that you're doing. Um, so please make sure you're capturing that in a way that can be read by the powers that be as complicated as we may all feel about that. So my key takeaways. Client data is precious. You are the steward of your client's data. As a member of a continuum of care, you have the power to help folks end their homelessness um, and help guide someone out of homelessness. High quality data stewardship is high quality client care. And your data impacts everyone. And also, your client is our client. None of us have a client that has not been helped or served by anyone else ever and we should make sure we are acting accordingly so that everybody helping that client can help them better. And, is that it? Oops. 
now I finally run into the technical difficulty portion of the evening. Did I lose my thing? Oops. Nope, there we go. Okay, I was so close. That's everything. Thank you all so much for your time and attention today. And I have a survey at the very end of this. I have some resources. And there's a survey. It also has a QR code out there. Um, yeah. D and I'm here for questions. If anyone has questions or thoughts, please feel free. It is now question and answer portion of the day. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sped through. Yeah, there's my contact information. Send an email and I'll give you my cell phone. That phone number goes to Teams and it's mildly a disaster. I will also answer it, but it's much harder to get through. You're not in the formal COC, then you're not in HMIS. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you aren't like, and so like when I say COC, I'm using it very broadly. Like I would include anyone working in this field enough to be in this room in the COC. But yeah, if you're not using HMIS or don't have access to it, um, yeah, raise your hand. And if you're interested in getting access to it, I can talk about that, folks. <laughs> So you're with the fire department, and then where are you with? Awesome. I'm glad you all are here. Thanks for coming. Property management. Yay, I love that there's property managers here. This is so good. Do people say that to you a lot? Yay, property management. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to vilify the problem. Not, obviously not all property managers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So since IHCDA is the HMIS lead for y'all, they, they do all the training and they administer the database and access to the database. Um, but I'd be happy to put you in touch with folks at IHCDA if that's of interest. Because yeah, the more, and there's typically a user fee. I don't know what their fee structure is though. Um, ours currently is $40 a user a month and it's not sufficient to cover our licensing fees. But that's a whole other conversation, but um, yeah, that's really cool. Having access is really nice because yeah, you can just see like who's where, who's accessed what services historically. And if you have updated contact information, that's also really nice. You can also get read only access if you just wanna look but you don't wanna input anything. That's also an option. Yeah. Cool, other questions? Yes, and then I would request a merge once you've been able to verify. But yeah, if, if you're like, I'm 90% sure that this person, but they're having a time and they're not up for giving you their information, yeah, I would still enter it, but then I would like flag it and just be like, make a note to merge it once you know who the correct profile should merge to. Yeah, absolutely, we can keep it continuous, yeah. That, uh, in Indianapolis, yes. I know a few, I, we have a few eviction prevention and diversion programs. Um, right now, HIP, North HIP is doing a whole, is, are they calling it the holistic housing still? Um, yeah, okay. Um, the HIP folks, Melissa behind you might be able to connect you to other Melissa who's doing a lot of that work. 
Um, and I know there's also just like a lot of churches and kind of independent crews who will do some eviction prevention, but it's kind of like you secretly have to know who is who to contact. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Other questions? Yeah, Melissa. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, faith-based service providers, um, we have we have a whole faith-based street outreach that actually like meets in an organized way in Indianapolis. Um, and they are starting to have more interest. I think Food for Souls is about to get HMIS, or has, H has historically had HMIS and they're about to get it again to start doing enrollments and things like that. Um, the relationship is widely variable. So we have like Wheeler Mission is 50% of our Indianapolis emergency shelter and they are not in HMIS, they use Mission Tracker. But we've had imports and then we had a whole import snafu. So there's always some kind of tension and struggle and we've like a significant portion of my work has been working to like work out the data problem just to get Wheeler in the system. Because if we miss Wheeler, we are like doomed. Like it completely tanks everything. Um, Score-wise for the NOFO, and we don't know where anyone is because they are just our huge emergency shelter system. Um, so, yes, and Wheeler does have a shelter here too. So, I've been—it's been really great though. We've been working really closely with them this last year. Um, I think the main thing is to find your common agenda. I know we're all coming at things a little bit differently, but if we can come and like explain these things and be like, hey, regardless of whether or not you are required to do this, if you can find some way to contribute to this, it will help everybody and kind of help people get on the same page. And I think we've had more and more um, faith-based organizations kind of coming in and that's been really great. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really excellent question. So some, most most organizations, if they're bigger, will have some kind of a database, and some are not really, not necessarily, the small, and the smaller ones won't necessarily. Um, yeah, there are specific data points that are needed for HMIS, and they could be captured in different ways, or if they were willing to get trained and like onboarded, um, and then funding, of course, is an issue here. But if they're willing and interested, they would be very welcomed into using HMIS and getting trained in support. I, I do support a lot of faith-based organizations. We have Holy Family Shelter and Family Promise um, who participate actively in HMIS in Indianapolis. Um, and just really making the effort to connect and have those conversations. And I would loop in your HMIS admin if you're doing it for balance of state, you would need to bring IHCDA, or no, here, sorry. Yeah. So. Other thoughts, questions? Everyone would like to leave. I don't know what's next for your days, but if you have other things and you would like to take off, feel free. If you wanna hang around and chat, I am here for a while. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Oh, wait. I'm sorry, thank you.